So what did we discuss in our last lecture? In the last lecture, we have seen the optical simulation results for uh, different kinds of algorithms, right? We have seen how Monte Carlo uh, is compared to TD. And uh, what did we observe in that? Like, uh, empirically, TD was doing a picture, right? That's what we have seen. And then we have also seen. Uh, the difference between SARSA and Q-learning using the CLIP uh, environment, right? So there, SARSA was learning the safer uh, path, and Q-learning was learning a optimal, learning the optimal path. But still, uh, if you remember, we have seen that SARSA was having uh, lesser reward than the, sorry, Q-learning was having lesser reward than the SARSA, right? In those plots, do you remember? So what was the reason? Like if we are plotting the reward, then Q learning was somewhere here, and Sarsa was somewhere here. Like Sarsa has a better uh, reward in the cliff environment. So what was the reason? Yeah, because we are plotting this uh, based on whatever rewards we are observing, right? So the behavioral policy was epsilon greedy policy, right? Even for the Q learning. The behavioral policy was epsilon gt, right? So uh, the Q learning, if this is the cliff, the Q learning was following this path, which is very close to the cliff, right? So uh, you are being behaving according to epsilon gt, although you are learning the optimal thing during the training process. Q learning is behaving epsilon gt, right? So it will keep falling into the cliff once in a while, so it will get a minus 100 reward occasionally. So that's why the behavioral, uh, the reward during the training process will be lesser for the Q-learner. But once you finish all the training and then uh, you learn the policy, right? If you evaluate that particular policy, then Q-learning obviously will have the better reward. Because in the once you training is over, you won't behave epsilon greedy, right? Whatever policy you learn, you will learn according to, like you'll stick to that in the Q-learning at least. So that is one thing which we have seen, and we have also seen uh, double Q learning, right? One. Uh... So maybe I'll just show you quickly those results. So for the double Q learning, uh, we have seen that there is a maximization bias, right? And when we were using double Q learning for some particular example, we were able to. Okay, anyway, so for the double Q learning, we were able to see that uh, having two uh, copies of the Q learning estimates will help us, right? Instead of using this as our, uh, instead of using this, what we were doing, we were uh, first finding what is the maximum uh, thing based on one of the estimates, like which is argmats over A. Q1 of S comma A, we were finding what is A, what is the best A according to this. And then uh, how are we finding the value of that A? By using Q2 of S comma A, right? We were first finding which is the best action according to one of the estimates and then finding what is the exact value using the other estimate. So we have seen that, uh, we have seen one example where the double Q learning will learn much faster than the Q learning, right? So that was one example which we have seen. And then what did we discuss? What else? We discussed one uh, model-based learning concept, right? What is model-based learning? Yeah, so in the Q learning, we are just learning the estimates of Q function, right? Instead of just learning that, you also learn these parameters RSA and PSS dash A. As you interact with the environment, you keep updating these parameters. And what will we do with these parameters?
so the q learning update uh, we know the q learning update right q new equal to q old plus something so that we can do for every interaction with the environment we can only do one update right like if you are in behaved according to if this is equal to s and this is equal to a you can only update q of s comma a for every step of the environment if you just follow q learning you can just update one value of q of s comma a so instead of that if you have these estimates you also simulate an experience like as if you are interacting with the real world you don't interact with the real world but you generate a simulator using these two parameters which you learned and generate some artificial data Syn synthesize uh, simulate your own interactions without actually interacting with the real world environment and based on that also you update your uh, q function so after every one uh, real time interaction maybe you can do couple of uh, simulated uh, updates and uh, we have seen one example where uh, we have seen in one grid world ex example we have seen that uh, if you use one uh, one is to ten like for every one real time environment interaction you add ten more simulated updates then it was doing much faster than uh, the just using uh, plain q learning right what was this algorithm called dyna q right so this is a combination of both the model based learning and uh, uh, model free learning because we are doing the actual interaction also and updating our q function based on that right so that's so this is called hybrid version of model based and uh, model free if you had only used the simulated data if you just use the interaction just to uh, predict your model and just use the simulated model then it's like a model based algorithm without using the real time data to update your queue you just update your pss dash a and rsa you just learn the model from the real time interaction and while estimating the queue if you just use only the simulated data then it could be a pure uh, model based learning or you just learn the model from model estimates from your uh, interactions and then maybe you can even do uh, basic value iteration right if you want so you just keep interacting with the environment with some random policy for some time and you somehow get an estimate of rsa and pss dash a then once you roughly estimate these then you can do if you, you can assume these are the true model parameters and you can do policy iteration if you want you can do value iteration if you want right that is also a pure model based algorithm like you are just learning the model from the interactions and after that you can use it in whatever way you want to find the optimal policy okay so there are a lot more uh, interesting model based algorithms like one popular algorithm is called mcts algorithm which is called monte carlo tree search algorithm which is also comes which also falls under model based algorithm this is very popular because it is used in this uh, game uh, engine called uh, alphago zero like alphago is a, a deep minds uh, go player which has uh, won over the world champion right so this is one of the basic algorithm which they have used in alphago okay i am not sure whether we'll have time to do this but try if i if we have time we'll do this in the later classes so which is called monte carlo tree search algorithm okay so that's a brief recap of what we have seen so far now we'll move into uh another uh, setup where uh like till now whatever we have uh, done for every state we were we were maintaining what is q of s comma a and what is v of s right because whatever environments which we have seen till now have some finite number of states or very small number of states not just finite very small number of states right in all the assignments that we have seen the grid world or uh, the cliff whatever we have seen the state space is within 100 states right so we can afford to maintain a separate value for each state but if you are training an agent, let's say for some game like chess or for some game like Go, uh, like, or
or let's say even a video game like if your state is the image which you see on the video game so for even a one like let's say you have a 100 cross 100 image and let's say each uh, uh, let's say there are three channels and every every channel value can be let's say even if you use 8 bits like 255 values every channel can take right so how many total possible states will be there right this many numbers you need right like 100 cross 100 image let's say three channels rgb and you have let's say uh, you are representing each number from 0 to 255 let's say you are using 8 bits so what will be the number of states that we'll have if you assume each possible image has some state Like that will be 255 power this, right? 256 power this. So which is like huge number of states, 256 power this. You have so many numbers and each each number can have 256 values, like 0 to 255, let's say. So you have such a large state space. So you cannot learn for every uh, possible configuration of the image. We cannot learn what is the value of that, right? It's not practical, right? Because there are so many states, you cannot maintain a table for every state, what is the value? Or for every action, what is the cure of SMI? So whatever we have seen till now is called tabular method because we are maintaining a table as to for this state, what is the value? For this state, what is the value? But if you go into such large state spaces, it's not practical to maintain the V of S or Q of S comma A for every possible state, right? Or let's say your state space itself is a continuous uh, state space. So let's say you are talking about the movement of some arm or something. So what is the angle of the arm currently? Let's say that is a state. So unless you discretize it or do some approximation, you cannot maintain a value for every possible state, right? So then what could be one uh, solution? Like if you have so many states, like, in fact, the number of states, I think in Go game, the number of states will be approximately like 10 to 170 states, right? Which is even uh, tough to store in a computer, right? If you have to store and compute on this uh, large state space. Uh, so, and uh, in fact, this number is more than the number of atoms that are present in the universe, right? So it's not practically feasible to maintain that. So what could be one uh, solution? We have seen this problem in even in bandits, if you remember. Like when we moved from the nor regular bandits to some case, what we have seen one type of bandits, right? What was it? Where we had, huh? Yeah, contextual bandits. We have seen, right? So there the state. Uh, can have, let's say we assume that the state has some features, right? Like for example, every user has some state is what, every user uh, feature is one state. So uh, let's say you're talking about uh, the location of the user or the age or uh, his income. So you can model a couple of features like this. So there are too many states, right? To actually note down. So what did we do in that case? To model the mean, uh, like expected, uh, like to model the expected reward or the probability that a user likes a article, we, we were not maintaining separate probability for every user, right? Do you remember what we did? We modeled it uh, using some function approximation, right? So we assume that uh, for a given user, the probability that he will like the article is a linear function of the state features. Right, so we cannot uh, assume separate probability for each user. We have to assume that it's some function of the state uh, and approximate it. So that's what uh, we'll do here also. Like uh, we'll just assume that uh, the state, uh, like the state will have certain features, and we'll just represent the state using those features. So, for example, if you are playing some video game, maybe uh, like let's say there is some ball which is moving around. And you have to just decide whether to move left or right based on the location of the ball. 
you don't need uh, separate action for every possible image right we just need some features of the image whether the ball is to the right of your uh, uh thing or whether it is to the left of the thing or maybe few other how fast the ball is moving maybe some features you want you don't need actual uh, pixel level data for that right you just need to extract certain features from the state and based on that you would decide uh, what action to take so that's what uh, uh, we'll move to which is called the function approximation setting where the number of states is uh, large and we are trying to uh, approximate the value function of a state using certain features of the state now v of s will not be actual function of the it will not be just will not be dependent on the actual state but it will depend only on certain features of the state maybe you can represent your state using certain uh, feature vector and your value of the state will just depend on the feature vector of the state okay so this is called function approximation for large state cases that's what we'll discuss today Okay. So we'll look at uh, two kinds of function approximations, uh, which are uh, the familiar methods which we know, which is called Monte Carlo based function approximation and TD based function approximation. We'll see that the Monte Carlo based function approximation will roughly be like uh, doing some SGD update on the function on will look like an SGD update, which is a stochastic gradient descent update. And the TD, a TD based approximation will not be an SGD, but it will be called some semi gradient update. We'll see what is why why it's called like that. Okay. And then uh, we'll also look at uh, what is called uh, deep Q networks, DQN. So uh, the deep Q network is like. A popular uh, algorithm which, which is like Q learning with function approximation, where the function that you are choosing to approximate your value function is the neural network. Okay, so previously we have seen in the contextual bandage, we have approximated the re estimated reward, expected reward of a state using linear function, right? If you remember, so the expected reward for a given user state, we model it as a linear function. So if you model instead of of a linear function if you use a neural network for the uh, approximating your value of the state then uh, in such a setting there is this deep q network will arise okay where the function approximation that you choose will be a neural network anyway we'll see these things in detail i'm just writing down the things that we'll discuss today so in this deep q network uh, uh, like mainly there will be two issues which we'll try to see uh, like maybe I'll discuss these issues when we discuss that, but roughly these are the topics which we'll discuss in today's lecture. Okay. So, as I said, we are dealing with large state spaces. So, for example, Go game. has around 10 power 170 states. So it is not possible to uh, maintain separate value for each method. So we are moving from tabular setting to uh, the solution is uh, to maintain state features. So let's say uh, we, we are modeling the state using some feature vector, let's say H of S. Like it's, S is a state and we are modeling uh, some the state using certain feature vector. Maybe let's say we are using three features to model the, to represent the state, let's say. So let's say this is a three dimensional state feature. Okay. Uh, like if you are modeling the V of S, you can model the states using some feature vector like this. Uh, let's say if you are learning the Q learning algorithm, if you are learning the Q value of some particular policy or Q star, 
then what will be the input per q star it will be s comma a right so you can model some features for every possible s comma a okay so either you can maintain separate feature for the state and separate features for the action and club them together and concatenate them together that is one way like your state has three features let's say your action has two features you can just concatenate them and make it one five feature vector or you can learn separately if you want for every possible state action pair you can learn some feature which is not independent like that. okay so the first step is you uh, translate your state or state action pair into some feature vector like this and then what we'll do we'll try to approximate our uh, value function using these features okay so let's say how will a linear approximator look like so let's say you are modeling uh, you are trying to estimate the value function of some policy pi so if you want to use linear approximator uh, what will our uh, value function look like y your value function will be a function of the state and uh, it is para it will be parameterized by some weights right so let's say w so it will look like this right w1 x1 of s plus w2 x2 of s maybe some bias okay so yeah, this is how we model right it's it's a function of the state but only depends on the features of the state okay so now learning the value function boils down to just learning these three these four weights w1 w2 w3 w4 okay so even if you have 10 power 170 states if you model it as a linear function like this and have three features then all that you have to learn is four numbers which is w1 w2 w3 w4 you have to learn the features you have to first uh, come up with some feature representation after that you have to just learn these four uh, features those four weights or you can use a neural network for uh, approximating the uh, value function so if you use a neural network it will look like this like you just pass this uh, features of the state as input for the neural network and maybe you let's say you have some neural network like this and maybe it will just give you the estimate of the value okay so your inputs will be the features of the state and your output will be the estimate of your value function okay so if you want to learn a q function what should we do what should the neural network take? Yeah, the neural network, uh, like there are generally two approaches which is followed. You, If your actions are very less, like if your actions are, let's say, only two, three actions, then uh, you can learn a separate uh, network for each value, each action. Okay. So let's say there are only three, let's say there are only two actions, left, comma, right. Okay. So then you can learn one left network and one right network, like where your input will be state. Your input can be state and output can be Q of S comma left. And you learn another network for right. Okay. Q of S comma right. Okay, so you can either uh, learn separate networks if you want for uh, each uh, action, or uh, you could or you could uh, actually pass uh, S comma A as the input. Uh, like you can pass S comma A as the features, and you can directly learn Q of S comma A for all possible S comma A's. Okay, you just input the features of the action also as the input to your network that is one option and uh, typically one more option which is more popular is uh, you just input your state uh, features you just input your state features let's say you have uh, let's say you have two actions which are possible then you just output directly both the 
Q values. Okay, so this is one architecture which is possible. Like you just uh, input the state, and the output will be all possible Q values for that state. So if there are two actions, the output layer will have two neurons. If it is uh, four actions, the output will have four uh, neurons. Okay, you just input the state. The network will output uh, how many ever actions you have, the Q value for all those actions. Is this clear? This one, like you, you can model it differently based on uh, your convenience. Like the last one is more popular. You just input the state features, and the output will be a vector of length equal to your action space. And if you have three actions, the output layer should have three neurons, so that it will output all the possible Q values for that particular state. This is the this is more useful because you have to do a match over all possible A, right? When you're updating your policy, uh, what will you do? You'll do match over A, Q of S comma A, right? So you need to estimate what is Q of S comma A for all possible A's. So you just get all of them in one uh, one pass here. Like you just input the state features, you get all the uh, action, all the Q of S comma A's for that state in one go. Okay. Those are hidden layers. Like, no, like uh, that you learn in a deep learning course. All that I'm saying is uh, you just do a forward pass using some neural network. Okay. You need not worry about uh, these details in this class. I'm just telling you we are approximating the function using some neural network. Okay. Yeah, somewhat like that. There you are meeting separate neural networks, so they'll have separate weights. Here you have only one set of weights. Okay. <clears throat> Any doubts at this point? All that I'm saying is we are approximating the Q function with some neural network, and there are multiple ways of doing that approximation. Either you learn, uh, you pass all the features, both the action and the state features, and get one Q of S comma A, or you just pass the state features and your action space is uh, finite or some small action space, then you can get the output, all the outputs in one go. Okay. So you can have multiple uh, things like this. So now, once you approximate this uh, function of interest, like in using a neural network, all that you have to learn is the weights of these uh, neural networks. Right, just like how we have some weights for your linear function, this neural network will also have some weights uh, which you try to learn. Okay, <clears throat> so this this is about what function you want to use to model your approximate Q function, right? Then what is left? What is the main? In both the cases, yeah, th those are two separate neural networks. The here, this one you have only one neural network which gives all possible action values. Result will be different based on what you do. Typically, this is used in practice, the last one. So these are all uh, uh, some choice design choices which you have to learn by uh, like trial and error. Like you have to, based on your problem, you have to try different things and learn what is a good uh, architecture or how many hidden layers you want, what uh, loss function you want to use, what optimizer you want to use, whether you want to use SDG or whether you want to use ADAM. So these are all things uh, which we'll not have time to discuss because these are things which you learn in a typical machine learning or a deep learning course. But uh, here I'm just telling you that uh, we have to use some function approximation because the state space is large. And one uh, traditional way is using a linear approximation like this, or you can use some neural network like this. So typically, if you are dealing with images, you won't even use neural networks like this, right? You'll use CNNs, which are called conventional neural networks, right? If you are uh, designing a 
video game agent then you, you have to process the images as the states right so i'll use some cnn so or if you are using it for designing some chatbot maybe you'll use rnn which are for recurrent neural networks right so depending on your application you will use different kinds of neural network architectures uh as i said we will not have time to go into uh, the deep learning aspects of this but uh, all that i want you to appreciate is we will approximate the state and action values using some function approximator uh, by passing the features uh, we'll get the q q values as the output okay so now we just model the uh, function as some approximation then what is left what what should we do now we have to come up with a way to find the optimal weights right if you want to find uh, the value function you need to find what are these w's right so how do we find the uh, how do we estimate these w's that's what is left because all the previous algorithms we have learned they were directly giving you q of s comma a for all possible s and a right that was a tabular method we are maintaining a table and we are updating whenever you visit state s and action a you are updating q of s comma a but if you have 10 power 170 states it uh, might not be possible to visit all the states right you will you might never visit all the states right how many ever games you play you might never cover all the states so you need to you cannot separately learn what is the value for each state so you by visiting only few states you will learn about the whole value function so that's possible because we have only four parameters to learn so even if you visit q states which are sufficiently rich enough then you will get a good approximator for all possible states all right so one uh, what how if you want to define what is the best uh, w like what is the optimal w how can we define it like optimal weights for our function so let's say you have some policy pi uh, and you want to estimate what is v pi and let's assume the state space is large okay so we use some function approximation let's say i denote the function approximation uh, as uh, v pi hat of s comma w some function approximator uh, which takes in uh, the features of the state uh, as input and it is parameterized by some weights w and it's an approximate uh, it will be your approximate uh, v pi s okay this is what we want to do right so how can we define our optimal uh, weights uh, we can define like this right like one simple way is v pi hat of s comma w minus uh, v pi s whole square where v pi s is the true uh, value function like we can use some mean square laws like this right we want to estimate uh, some good up like you want to find some good fit for our value function so you just uh, look at argmin over w right you are just finding the w which will minimize your uh, uh, error with the true value function right so this is one uh, basic way to do it but uh, like there here you are giving equal weightage for all possible states right because you are summing over all s and the error for every state is being weighed equally right but in practice maybe this pi uh, that you are looking at might not even enter into few states right you are following some particular policy pi you want to estimate what is the value for this policy pi so if this policy uh, generally if you follow this policy maybe it will go through certain states with uh, high probability and some states might it might not at all visit or it might very rarely visit okay so then uh, it does not make sense to use all our efforts to minimize the value function of over all possible states right because you will have limited computation power you don't want to invest that in uh, all the states equally you might want to prioritize the states which are of more import, more interest or uh, more probable while using this policy pi so generally what uh, people do is instead of minimizing this what they will minimize is
So you just weight this with the probability of phi of f is uh, here. Uh, it's not the policy. Uh, like it's not from mapping from S T L. This is the probability of being in uh, state S if you follow policy pi. So let's say you keep following policy pi. Uh, what is the probability that, or roughly how much time you'll spend in this state S? You can think like that. So let's say you start. Uh, let's say there is some fixed start state. Like in all our grid environment, we have some fixed start state, right? So let's say there is some initial start state. You start from that state and keep following policy pi uh, till you reach terminal state. So let's say you do this some thousand times. So you just measure how much, how many times you visited state S out of all the steps. Then you will roughly know how much time you are spending in state S while following policy pi, right? You just uh, start. You just take lot of. You just generate lot of episodes from. Some particular state, starting state. If there is a starting state, then you see how many times you visited state S by total number of interactions you had. So based on that, you can get some rough estimate of uh, how likely you will be in state S while following policy pi, right? So then uh, you want to minimize the error for those states which you are likely to visit while following policy pi. So you are giving more weight for those uh, states. Which you will encounter while following policy pi. Okay. So this is just a weighted uh, error of our uh, original uh, error function. So this is probability of uh, visiting status while following policy pi. Okay, it's just a weighted, uh, weighted version of our uh, error. So we are just giving higher importance uh, since for states that are likely to be visited. That are likely to be visited while following policy pi. So now, uh, now we want to minimize this uh, function. Okay. So one uh, standard way of doing this is using a stochastic gradient descent, right? So what will if this is our error function? What will be our uh, if this is our error function, which we want to minimize? Uh, what will be uh, the gradient. So you are, if you want to do SGD for this, we'll do like this, right? W new equal to W old minus some con small constant times the gradient of this function. We want to minimize this loss function. So which is like uh, a, a gradient, a stochastic gradient descent for this will be uh, what? Some this will be uh, two times this error function, right? Like you can observe the two into the alpha, so some small constant times we had the oh, oh, SW minus V pi of s because you are doing stochastic gradient descent. This pi of s will naturally be taken care because you are doing this only for the states which you visit while following policy pi, you are interacting according to policy pi. And uh, you are updating your states based on that. So the states which you encounter more frequently, that state will naturally contribute more to this error term. So the weight will be taken care if you do this uh, through interaction. So so this will be our typical into what else we have to write? Del of uh, right. This will be our gradient update, right? If you have this thing. So, what will be the issue that we'll face? Let's say you want to do this algorithm. What uh, What is some practical issue we'll face? Because we want to estimate the value of some policy pi. And 
we have approximated it using some uh, weights and we are trying to learn the optimal weights using some sgd algorithm like this but uh, what is one practical issue we'll face here Yeah, that's the issue which we'll face, right? Because we don't know VPI, right? We cannot do this, right? So that's where the Monte Carlo and the TD thing come into picture, okay? So if you already know the VPI, then it's like a supervised learning. There is nothing that you'll do here. You, if someone gives you the true values, you just fit a function to it, right? This is just like a linear regression problem or some uh, basic uh, regression problem using a neural network. There is nothing much we'll do here. So, but the main issue is uh, we don't know that we don't know true values, right? So, this is where our Monte Carlo methods come into picture. Like Monte Carlo approximation is. So, any guesses? What we'll do? A straightforward guess. So we want to do this SGD, but we don't know the true values of VPI. So if I if I want to do something using Monte Carlo, what can I do? Some approximation for this? Any straightforward guesses? Yeah, so you just run one episode of Monte Carlo and you get GT. And instead of uh, VPI of S true value, you just sub substitute gt there right that's what monte carlo approximation tells us so you just uh, approximate v pi of s uh, using gt okay so essentially the update will be this Okay, <laughs> so this is a Monte Carlo based uh, function approximation method. So if you want to use TD based method, what should we substitute here? So how do you think the TD based approximation will look? What should we write here? Hmm? RT, only RT plus one? So we have done a lot of things, right? There's a few learning TD, TD, N step TD. Still, you're not telling me what we should write here. RT plus one plus gamma times V hat S gamma double. Right? So this is what is uh, TD based uh, uh, approximation. Okay. Mm, but uh, uh, if you look at it carefully, uh like here this term is also having this parameter w right like if you want to properly write uh, some error function and try to take the derivative then you have to differentiate even this term right because that is also a function of w you understand what i mean like if you write the when you're taking the derivative you have to take the derivative with respect to this also right because this also has a parameter w in it so that's why this is not a proper gradient descent algorithm so that's why this is called semi gradient descent algorithm because you are taking a derivative only with respect to this term that's why you are getting this but you are ignoring the dependence of w with this term okay because there are two terms which depend on w but you are taking the derivative only with uh, one term but you are ignoring the dependence of W on the other term, okay? 
both uh, huh? so we can differentiate uh, but it will lead to some issues mm, so that's why this is called semi gradient term. so you are saying why can't we just differentiate that's what you're saying right? yeah we can differentiate but it will lead into some issues uh, which uh, uh, will not go into but uh, Generally, this is the method which is used, which is, uh, that's why it's called a semi-gradient algorithm, because you're not differentiating with uh, some terms, okay? Actually, last year, I've uh, taken some three, four lectures on uh, why you should not differentiate and uh, proved some results, but this time, I'm not sure whether I want to teach that or not. So, like, whether this, like, now we know that uh, stochastic gradient descent will converge at least to local minima of the error function, right? So, we had some error function, uh, which is this, and uh, this Monte Carlo based method here, we are just writing gt instead of v pi of s. So, that is in expected sense, it's correct only, right? Like, expected gt is equal to v pi. So, this is again a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Even if you substitute gt instead of v pi of s, it's a proper stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So at least we have the guarantee that uh, SGT will converge to the local minima of the error function, right? But here we are doing something uh, different, right? We are not even doing a proper uh, SGT, right? So then the question comes whether it will converge at all, right? Whether it will converge at all, and if at all it converges, whether it is of any, whether it has any relation with the W star. Right, we are interested in this W star, right? So whether this iterative algorithm, whether it will converge to something or it will diverge and keep uh, going around, uh, that is one question. And the other question is, if at all it converges to something, what is the relation between, let's say it converges to some uh, thing called WT, let's say. Like after, after some iteration, let's say it converges to some value called WTT. How, what is the relation between WTD and W star, right? Can we have any uh, guarantees, right? So these kind of things uh, are, we can do for linear approximations. If you assume that your function is linear approach, linear approximation, then you can give certain guarantees. Okay, even this method will converge and the difference uh, between the WTD and W star will be at most this much. We can give certain guarantees like that if you assume your function is a linear function. But if you once start using CNNs and deep neural networks, uh, there are no such uh, rigorous guarantees. Okay. Yeah, all that uh, you do is you try it and see what happens. And generally, the performance is good. Right. Okay. So that's why this is called uh, semi gradient method. And generally, convergence is guaranteed if the function is a linear approximation. Okay. Uh, I think the book in nine, section 9.3 has a lot of uh, detailed analysis on this. Uh, which talks about, uh, it takes the linear uh, case and shows that this particular iterative algorithm will converge to something. And it also derives the sum bound on how far this WTD will be from the W star. Like the error, the difference between WTD and W star is not too much. That the guarantee the book has uh, derived in section 9.3. You can just have a quick look at it if you're curious about uh, what the field is there. Okay. the estimate this function like this function if if you use a neural network it's a non-linear function right because you will use some activation function etc uh, but if it's a linear if your value function approximation is a linear function then these guarantees are there okay The function v by hat is uh, so 
we'll see if uh, time permits and if you are interested we'll see some of these results later but uh, in today's lecture i want to uh, move to a topic called the tqn which is deep q network we'll briefly discuss some issues with it so this uh, dqn uh, is again similar to q learning algorithm where since you have a lot of states we won't be able to use tabular approximation for your q function we'll just use a function approximator right we'll use some neural network we'll use some neural network to estimate what is the optimal uh, q function okay so we want to we want to find uh, what is q star if you find what is q star you know what is an optimal policy rate arg maps over a q star of s comma s will give you the can you close that if you have an optimal if you can find q star then you can find the optimal policy so then we want to find what is the q star and since we have a lot of states and actions possible then we'll go for some neural network approximation so similarly here we'll try to minimize some expected value of uh, uh, this thing like you will model the q function using some weights w and you will just try to minimize this uh, you will try to minimize this error okay maybe where the expectation is with respect to like we have seen right we this is also like expectation right this weighted average is like an expectation right where the expectation is with respect to uh, the probability that will visit that state is while following policy pi right i can write it as an expected pi of error right i can write it like this right where the error we are just giving more weight to the state which we will encounter while following policy pi. So similar to that, you can think of this as uh, uh, some expectation or with respect to state value pairs, which you will encounter while following the, let's say, the behavioral policy or the optimal policy which you want. So this expectation is with respect to the probability of seeing S comma I. Okay. It's a, again a weighted average where the weight is the probability of seeing state s comma i okay and we want to minimize this uh, over all possible w okay <laughs> so a stochastic gradient uh, descent for this will look like this right Right. So into this. So this is uh, this is what we have seen before also. This is the stochastic gradient descent for this. And uh, as usual, we don't know this uh, Q star. And uh, what will we do? We'll do the regular thing, which is uh, instead of that, we'll just substitute this R T plus one plus gamma times. What will we substitute? Maths over a q hat of uh, st plus one comma a and w t right q hat of this right so this is the standard trick which we have seen so one issue that uh, you will face with this is uh, uh, for so here you are trying to uh, approximate your q star of st comma at with this term right with this bot with this term which we are showing here so but this term itself is dependent on wt right so you don't have some fixed target right let's say you are talking about some state s1 comma action a1 right you want to approximate this with the q star of s comma a1 with some num with some number and and you want to minimize some weights with respect to this error. And your 
target will keep changing as your w changes right if you come to the same state s comma s1 comma a1 again you are trying to fit that to a different value right because by the time the w would have changed right if it was a supervised learning uh, this value will not change right it will just depend on s comma a s whenever you give s1 comma a1 you will have the same target if i call this as the target which you are trying to fit to you are trying to fit this function to this target right this is the function which you are trying to fit to this target now what is happening is uh, as you are learning your w's your target keeps changing right because your target itself now is a function of w because of this approximation if it was some supervised learning you know someone would have given you this data okay for s1 comma a1 this is of value q star of s1 comma a1 for example if you are doing some image classification you would have been given some images so if you pass like for every image you will know the true label and that label won't change whenever you come after some time right the true label will remain the same even if you pass that uh, image uh, through the neural network you might what you get in the neural network output will keep improving but your true label will remain the same if you have a cat image it will always say cat because you know the true value for some time training data but here the target itself will keep changing with time because your target itself is a function of uh, wt so this is called non stationary target problem okay because what you are trying to fit to itself is not fixed this is some uh, function which you are trying to approximate but to what value you want to approximate it that itself is not uh, fixed so this is called non stationary target problem because if you visit the same state action pair again then this function will ask you to fit to some other value okay because the w would have changed by then so this term will keep changing is this problem clear to everyone because what you are trying to fit to is not some constant it is keeping it keeps changing with time so that's why this is called non stationary target problem okay so if you keep changing your target then uh, your algorithm might not converge because now you will say uh, you try to fit to this value by the time it tries to come closer to that value you again change your target and say you don't no 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 you don't fit to that you fit to this value right yeah these are there these are there in that also for linear approximation everything will work Uh, these problems are there. There, I said. In these two methods, right? Yeah. But yeah, these are there. I'm just discussing one solution for that. Okay. So this is called the non-stationary target problem because uh, you are fixing some target, and by the time the function uh, approximator is trying to come closer to that, you will again shift your target. So it might not converge well. Okay. so one solution that is proposed in the literature is uh, what you can do is uh, here your targets are function of these weights w's right right now like your current q value the target depends on your current q estimate because if this is the target then the target it depends on q hat because rt plus 1 plus gamma times this maths of q hat is there so what uh, people have suggested is if you keep changing the target after every step of interaction that might be too much for the neural network to handle and converge to like the back there is something called back propagation algorithm right which is sgd algorithm so the sgd algorithm might not converge if you keep changing the target very frequently after every step you are changing your target so instead of that what has been suggested is you fix your target for some time okay for uh, like you you decide what target you want to reach to and fix the target for some time and treat that as some supervised learning problem okay so if i fix this w for some time in this uh, here the target depends on wt right right because of the change in wt your target is changing right so what i can do is i can just uh, let's say i'll fix this to some w hat okay i fix some w to w hat and uh, treat this as some constant the w as some constant okay only for the target 
uh, only for this expression then it's like some supervised learning right because i fix the w so my target is fixed i am not changing this w in every time slot in the target space i keep this fixed and uh, uh, you think of it as some uh, function which is giving you the true value you fix the w and uh, you just uh, whenever you want uh, the estimate of this q star you ask this you calculate using this w hat and keep doing sgd over that like this wt you are updating you are updating the wt but whenever you want the true value you are calculating it based on this w hat okay so this is like uh, what you will do is you will maintain two copies of your neural network you will maintain one copy called the target q network and uh, the actual network which you are trying to learn okay so you are you have some neural network right which will predict the uh, q value which will predict the q value right so you maintain one neural network whose weights you are trying to learn okay and you maintain another neural network copy okay uh, which will give you the target uh, uh, target q star okay which will give you this target okay so whenever you want to know what is q star of s comma a while doing this sgd like while doing this sgd you need q star of s comma a right so when now you need q star of s comma a you go to this target q network and ask what is an estimate of q star of s comma a okay so this target q network will give you some estimate right and you are you fix the values for this network right so it won't keep changing because you fix the values for this network for this network you are doing the sgd you are maintaining two copies one is called the target q network this is the target q network this is the q network which you are learning okay so what you will do is you will fix your weights randomly let's say initially you fix this target uh, network weights randomly but you freeze them you don't update them okay once you fix them how many are times you ask the q value it will give you the same q value right if your s comma a is same because your weights are fixed it will give you the same value if your input is same output will be same so that means the target will be stationary so uh, but what is the issue this is not the actual q star right this is some random weights which we initialized it might not represent the q star right but uh, all that we are doing is we are keeping it stationary so that it will converge to something so what you will do is you will fix this uh, target q network for some time and update the weights of this second q network using the sgd like this you do this for some amount of time and this uh, you would have got some wt plus 1 at some time t these weights would have become some wt of this uh, neural network which you are trying to learn at some time t you will have some weights wt right so this might be so what you will do is uh, maybe after every thousand steps what you can do is you you would have got some w thousand right at some time thousand these weights of this network would have become some value w thousand what you do is you just initialize the target q network with w thousand now previously you started with some random weights for your target q network right after doing the training for some thousand steps what you do is you replace the random weights of the target q network with whatever your latest net weights are for this network you would have got some w thousand w at equal to thousand you would have some weights for this network you just uh, Uh, replace the target uh, q network weights with this w thousand okay now you fix that again for some another thousand slots you treat your tar target network as some fixed network with weights which are initialized by this w thousand value now again you train this network for another thousand slots okay so then it will become w two thousand again you change your target q network with uh, you update your target q network weights to w2000 so for 1000 slots you freeze your target q network and train the other network after every 1000 slots you just refresh your uh, target q network with the latest weights so all that we are doing is if you do this for every slot then it will becomes a normal uh, training right after every slot if you refresh your target q network weights 
then it is like just maintaining one uh, uh, q network so what we are doing is if we change the tar target every after every slot it uh, it keeps fluctuating the target keeps fluctuating so your std might not converge at all so you are trying to come up with some uh, thing where you are trying to uh, come up with some uh, quick uh, way to resolve this problem by fixing your target weight for some time so that for at least for 1000 slots the neural network which you are training has some fixed target so it will try to come closer to that target then you update your target weights now again try to fit to the new target which you have come up with again you train again you fit okay is this clear to everyone In in simulations, we observe that it is converging, so there are no uh, such rigorous guarantees. Yeah, the, that will also have all these problems. Here, huh? Here it is ST plus one only. Thanks for pointing. Yeah. The next state, uh, like the same thing which we do in the TD, where s dash is st plus one. Is this concept of target queue network clear? So, since the target is changing, you want to roughly uh, make this problem like a supervised learning for some time. If in a supervised learning, the targets will remain fixed. So you're trying to emulate the supervised learning by fixing your target weights so that uh, for some time you think you can happily think of it like a supervised learning problem and try to fit to the target and after that you update your target with your current weights okay so this is one tweak that you do for fixing the non-stationary target problem okay uh, and this is one issue which uh, that the EQ and paper try to address this. Like generally, if you blindly use the uh, Q learning algorithm with function approximator, it was not converging. So uh, some people have tried this uh, tweak for that problem and it has worked well. Okay. So this is one popular solution which was used in the literature. Okay. So any doubts at this point? For us? So this is one issue which uh, we are solving using the target network. So you are maintaining two copies of your Q network. One is a target network and one is thing which you are learning. So there is another uh, issue which you will face in the DQN. Uh, like the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Uh, like if you are doing a supervised learning, the stochastic gradient descent algorithm is known to converge at least to local minima. Right? So one uh, important uh, aspect of that proof is that if you update uh, some state is right now in the next time slot what state you are updating should be an iid state like you randomly sample one state and update the q value of that state and again you randomly sample another state and you update the q value of that state if you do this in an iid fashion then the stochastic gradient descent is known to converge okay so you are this SGD you are doing, right? This SGD you are doing, right? You are doing for some state ST80 right now. In the next step, you will do for some other state action pair, ST plus one, AT plus one. If your state action pairs which you are choosing, if these are chosen IAD across time, that is you choose some arbitrary state action pair right now. And in the next time flip, you choose another arbitrary state action pair and you keep doing this then the SGD is known to converge, okay? But uh, in our uh, RL problem, your ST plus one is not some random state, right? It will depend on what ST is. Do you agree? Because ST plus one will be, will depend on what ST is, right? Because of the MDP property, like there is a correlation, right? If you are in some state ST, if you are in some state now, only few other states you can go to in the next state. Like if you are in the grid problem, if you are in the start state, the next state cannot be the end state. There are a lot of only four neighboring states which are possible as ST plus one. So there is this correlation which is coming into picture. Like your ST plus one is highly correlated with uh, what is ST. 
so the stochastic gradient descent convergence proof assumes this property that your uh, uh, success, successive of, uh, uh, updates should be iid but that property we are breaking here in the in this update because your sp plus 1 is highly correlated with what sp is then the convergence proof of stochastic gradient descent will not work here okay uh, or it is generally known not to converge if uh, the data is highly correlated across time so there this uh, in the literature there is another tweak to solve this problem which is called uh, memory replay buffer so what this memory replay buffer is uh, you are visiting some state action pairs right uh, so you are starting me some state s not uh, you are taking some action a not and you are getting some reward so you are following some trajectory right so what you do is uh, you keep uh, saving these trajectories in some buffer right now we are not storing this uh, behavioral data right all that we want is uh, you are in some state st you will observe what is uh, st plus 1 and you will do this update and you forget what your previous st is you don't have to store this data you don't have to store trajectories in your uh, memory right so what this memory replay buffer is telling is you store the last uh, let's say 1000 uh, state actions that you took so from s1 to let's say s1000 okay or st2 st minus 1000 right you store the last 1000 interactions you had with the environment and while deciding what s comma a you want to update next okay so you don't update s after you are in some state st after that you don't update your uh, next state you don't update the queue of s comma a for your next state but take uh, one of these last 1000 interactions and sample one state s comma a randomly among these things you have you have the last 1000 uh, state action pairs stored in your buffer what you want to update next you randomly sample one state action pair from this and do this step for that test at okay so update this for such s comma a which you are randomly sampling from your buffer and so in this way you are trying to break the correlation so you have 1000 s comma a and you are randomly sample, sampling one of them and updating this uh, uh, q function based on that 